Svetlana Alalieva, that's such a shitty family. This is how folk art reacted to the event that put the Politburo of the Central Committee of the CPSU and other governing bodies of the Soviet Union on their ears. Joseph Stalin's beloved daughter, whom foreign media called the Red Princess, became a non-returnee. Svetlana caused a lot of trouble even to her father. The daughter's stormy temperament resulted in a series of novels that began with Svetlana at a minor age. From the choice of his daughter, Stalin often became enraged, which fell on the heads of the hapless suitors. Svetlana was born in 1926. Stalin was 46 years old at the time, his wife Nadezhda Alalieva was 25. According to a family legend, Stalin in 1903 in Baku rescued little Nadia from the water when she fell from the embankment into the sea. But in fact, they met in 1917 in revolutionary Petrograd, where the Alalievs lived. A 16-year-old impressionable and romantic high school student, while still a child, fell madly in love with a man 22 years older, who returned from exile, a longtime family friend. They got married quickly. But over time, the romance passed, and it was not easy to live with Stalin. The mother was strict with her daughter, and the father, on the contrary, spoiled and caressed her. But over time, according to Svetlana, the mother in the photos became sadder and sadder. Her parents were fighting. Nadezhda was thinking about a divorce. There is evidence that she was jealous of her husband, that she was tormented by severe headaches, bouts of melancholy, and that she constantly took caffeine. That she had some kind of mental illness. Svetlana's nanny heard how, a few days before her death, Nadezhda confessed to her friend that she was tired of everything, she was sick of everything, nothing pleases her, even the children. On November 7, 1932, at a banquet on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the revolution, another quarrel occurred. A half-drunk Stalin allegedly threw cigarette butts and orange peels in his wife's face. He said, Hey, you, eat. And she screamed, I'm not H-E-Y for you. Got up and left. Molotov's wife Paulina Zemchusinov followed her and seemed to calm her down. And on the night of November 9th, Nadezhda shot herself with a small, almost toy Walter, given to her by her brother. Interestingly, a few years before that, the leader's eldest son, Yakov, tried to shoot himself, which his father was always dissatisfied with. But the bullet went right through. Ha! Ah, Stalin laughed at him. The death of his mother struck the boy terribly, devastated, which took away his faith in people and in friends. He always considered his mother his closest and most devoted friend, he perceived her death as a betrayal, as a stab in the back. And he hardened. Communicating with his loved ones must have been a painful reminder of her for him every time. And he began to avoid this communication, Svetlana wrote. Sunny childhood is over. Mom died when Svetlana was six years old. They didn't tell her the truth. She thought her mother had died of acute appendicitis. Stalin was still affectionate with his daughter, but gradually no one from the usual circle of relatives and friends remained in the house. Someone was arrested. According to Svetlana, nothing good awaited her mother if she had remained alive, sooner or later she would have been among her husband's opponents. It is impossible to imagine that she would have remained silent, seeing her best old friends die, Bukharin, Yenyakids, Redans, she would never have survived this. Perhaps fate granted her a death that saved her from even greater misfortunes awaiting her? Since 1937, a guard has been assigned to Svetlana. An adult, a security officer, followed me to school, from school and wherever I went, to the dacha, to the theaters, not nearby, but a little further away. When I noticed that he was rummaging through my school bag and reading my diary, which I carried with me to show my friends, I hated him. I had to put on my coat not in the general locker room, but in a special nook, next to the office, where I went, blushing with shame and anger. He also cancelled breakfast at the big break in the common dining room and they began to take me somewhere to a specially fenced-off corner, where he brought my sandwich from home. I was already in my first year of university and begged my father to cancel this order, saying that I was ashamed to go to university with such a tale. The father obviously understood the absurdity of the situation and said only, well, to hell with you, let them kill you, I'm not answering. So, it was only at the age of seventeen and a half that I got the right to go alone to university, to the theater, to the cinema and just to the streets. But at about the same time, in 1942-1943, Svetlana was waiting for new shocks. 
She, like her mother, fell in love with a very adult man at the age of 16, screenwriter Alexei Kabler. She met him at a party at her brother's house there, at the dacha in Zubilov. Vasily, by that time already a military pilot, was a consultant for one of the films and contacted the creators of the film. They started hanging out at his dacha. Vasily himself took Roman's wife Carmen away for a while, and Svetlana was conquered by the screenwriter of the famous films Lenin in October and Lenin in 1918, 40-year-old Lovelace Kabler. He tickled his nerves by playing in love with Stalin's daughter. But it didn't go beyond kissing. The guards intervened. Kabler was exiled to Vorkuta. And Stalin made a scandal for his daughter, I know everything. All your phone conversations. Your Kabler is an English spy he's been arrested. You should look at yourself, who needs you? Svetlana has never forgiven her father for these insulting words. Stalin's relations did not develop not only with Svetlana. His two sons, Yakov and Vasily, were also deprived of their father's love. Moreover, the fate of all Stalin's children was quite tragic. Yakov was captured by the Germans, where he died. Vasily ended up in prison after the death of his father and died at the age of 41. Svetlana fled from the USSR to the USA, but she did not find happiness there either. On March 9, 1967, Stalin's daughter Svetlana Alalieva, who was in India by special permission of the Soviet government, contacted the US Embassy in New Delhi and declared her unwillingness to return to the USSR. After she made her written statement, the United States Ambassador to India, Chester Bowles, kindly offered her political asylum and a new life in the West. Thus, the former Soviet princess turned, perhaps, into the most famous Namurgani. For the United States, this act of Svetlana Alalieva, who during Stalin's lifetime was called Svetlana Stalin, and later changed her surname, turned out to be a complete surprise. According to the American intelligence services, they did not even suspect that she was now in India, and perceived the princess that had fallen on their heads rather as a burden, burdening the relations that were being established at that time with the Soviets. Ambassador Bowles later recalled how he reported this upstairs, about nine o'clock in the evening in India I said, I have a person here who claims that she is Stalin's daughter, and we believe that she is real. We suggest sending her by plane to Rome, after which we can stop and think about everything. I don't give her any guarantees that she will be able to fly to the States. I will only allow her to leave India, and then we will decide which part of the world to choose next, the USA or somewhere else where she can settle peacefully. If you don't agree with this, let me know before midnight. Svetlana did not always bear the surname Alalieva. Before the death of the leader, she bore her father's surname. After Stalin's death, her belongings belonging to him, first of all documents, were taken away from her. Later, some of them were returned in the form of copies. That's when she changed her last name. In one of the last interviews, Alalieva spoke quite negatively about her parent, she accused him of destroying her life. Wherever I live, I remain my father's political prisoner, she confessed. No unambiguous instructions were received from Washington in this regard, and Bowles began to act at his own risk, as it was later claimed, in a rather unorthodox way, primarily in the interests of Svetlana herself. Talking to her, he first of all reminded her of her daughter and son who remained in the USSR. The first question is, are you really sure that you want to part with them? You have a daughter and a son there, and this is an important step. Have you really thought it through? You can go back to the Russian embassy right now, just go to bed and forget about all this, get up in the morning and go to Moscow, as required by your leadership. Svetlana immediately replied to this, if this is your decision, I will address the press tonight and announce that not only democratic India does not accept me, but now democratic America refuses to accept me. So Svetlana Alalieva's intentions were very firm, although she later assured that before coming to India she had no thoughts of running away and this decision arose later and completely spontaneously. Even before her visit to the American embassy, Alalieva tried to ensure that she was allowed to live in India, she turned to both the Indian and Soviet authorities for this. Arriving in India on December 20, 1966 with a permit issued to her personally by a member of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the CPSU Kasigan, to accompany the ashes of a friend or common-law husband Brijesh Singh, whom Svetlana met two years before these events in Moscow. She lived for some time in the house of his nephew Dinesh Singh, Secretary of State of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of India. 
Upon learning of Stalin's daughter's desire to stay in India, Soviet Ambassador Benediktov was horrified and began insisting that she return to Moscow on March 8, saying at the same time that she would never be allowed to leave her country again. Mainan, return in 1967 was dictated not by political, but by human motives, Svetlana later claimed. Let me remind you here that when I left for India to take the ashes of a close Indian friend there, I was not going to become a defector, I planned to return home in a month. However, in those years I paid tribute to the blind idealization of the so-called free world, a world with which my generation was completely unfamiliar. However, the flighty Alalaeva will change her assessments and sympathies more than once, which in the end will completely confuse her biographers and historians. Meanwhile, the Indian government feared condemnation from the Soviet Union and could at any moment interfere in the fate of the daughter of the Soviet leader, so the American ambassador decided to urgently send her from India to Rome. And after Rome, Alalaeva immediately went to Geneva, where the Swiss government issued her a tourist visa and accommodation for six weeks. At the same time, she spent three weeks in a Catholic monastery. It is unlikely that Alalaeva was very religious, most likely, her interest in religion was also just one of the ways to find herself at least in something and act contrary to the wishes of others. So, she was baptized and baptized the children in May 1962 in Moscow with Archpriest Nikolai Golubsov, in the midst of an anti-religious campaign conducted by General Secretary Khrushchev. Once in the United States in 1967, Alalaeva becomes a non-returnee. Later, she admits that when she went to India with the ashes of her common-law husband, she was not going to emigrate. Svetlana eventually left Europe for the USA, leaving in the USSR by that time almost no adult children were born, 22-year-old Joseph and 17-year-old Ekaterina. Upon arriving in New York in April 1967, she gave a press conference at which she condemned her father's legacy and the activities of the Soviet government. But the main thesis of her somewhat confused speech was that not only Stalin was to blame for the repressions, his entire entourage, as well as the party itself, had a hand in them. It was thanks to them all that the barbaric dispossession, the construction of the gulag, the execution of the innocent and the destruction of the color of the nation took place. In the USSR, Stalin's Daughters Act was first tried to hush up, but later they were forced to give a brief negative comment. After living for several months in the village of Mill Neck on the north coast of Long Island in New York under the protection of the secret services, Alalaeva then moved to Princeton and New Jersey, where she lectured and engaged in writing, later ended up in Pennington, then in Wisconsin. In the USA in 1967 Svetlana Alalaeva published 20 letters to a friend, in which she recalls her father and the mores of the inhabitants of the Kremlin. The book became a worldwide sensation. Alalaeva writes about Stalin, who, in her opinion, saw enemies everywhere, it was already a pathology, it was a persecution mania from emptiness, from loneliness. He was extremely bitter against the whole world. However, Alalaeva is no longer talking about her father, but about her unfulfilled life behind the Kremlin walls, which was filled with losses, disappointments and losses. Some media claimed that the publication brought Alalaeva a significant fee, about $2.5 million. While still living in the USSR, she was writing a book about her life, and one of the copies of this manuscript was stolen, placed at the disposal of the English and Soviet journalist Victor Lewis, who worked closely with the KGB, who sent it to the West and published excerpts in the German magazine Sharp, deliberately distorting a number of facts. Lewis also enjoyed dubious fame as the first publisher of the manuscript of Nikita Khrushchev's memoirs and Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Cancer Corps in subsequent years. According to Natalia Solzhenitsyna, in the latter case, this was done clearly in order to block the corresponding publication in the New World in the USSR. Later, in one of her subsequent books, which did not cause such a stir, published under the title Just One Year, Svetlana Alalaeva admitted that Brijesh Singh advised her to forward the manuscript of 20 letters to a friend from the USSR to India, and this was done with the help of the Indian ambassador to the USSR Triloka Nath Kaul in January 1966. However, impractical Svetlana quickly spent the money she earned for publishing on charity and unsuccessful investments, quarreled with publishers and complained that she did not have the gift to correctly evaluate people, which her father was endowed with. The marriage with the American architect also did not last long. Two years later, in 1972, the family broke up. Lana Peters has a second daughter, Olga. In 1970, she married the American architect William Peters, changed her first and last name to Lana Peters and had a daughter with him.
However, this marriage, like all previous ones, did not last long. In 1972, she divorced, and in 1982 she left with her daughter for the UK, to Cambridge. However, she did not have a normal relationship with her American daughter, as well as with the children who remained in the USSR. Olga Peters, who later renamed herself Chris Evans, was sent to a Quaker boarding school, and Alalaeva herself went on to travel the world and rushed into experiments with various religions. In 1983, after the Soviet government stopped blocking Svetlana's attempts to communicate with children from the USSR, her son Joseph began to call her regularly and even planned to visit his mother in England, but the Soviet authorities did not allow him on this trip. In 1984, Stalin's daughter herself suddenly decided to return to the Soviet Union with her daughter Olga, and there she was received literally with open arms, Soviet citizenship was returned, an apartment was provided, etc. But the grumpy Alalaeva did not stay in Moscow for long, after the deterioration of relations with the Moscow authorities, she moved to Georgia, where her father's only museum operated where she was given all the honors that the local authorities were able to render at all she was settled in a two-story one-room apartment with an improved layout, established monetary allowance, special protection, and the right to call a car. However, having lived in these conditions at home for less than two years, Svetlana still yearned for her former life in the USA and sent a letter to the Central Committee of the CPSU with a request to allow her to leave the USSR again. This time it took the personal intervention of the new general secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, after which in November 1986 Stalin's daughter was allowed to return to America. Alalaeva, according to some sources, retained dual citizenship of the USSR and the USA, and according to others, she renounced Soviet citizenship, settled in Wisconsin and rarely gave interviews to journalists. In recent years, Svetlana Alalaeva lived under the name Lana Peters in a nursing home near Madison, Wisconsin, and died on November 22, 2011 at the age of 85.